Hey, what's up, everybody, and welcome to another edition of Drinks with Johnny, where today I'll be joined by my co-hosts, Brandon and Sam, as we celebrate the lives of both Lane Staley and Kurt Cobain. Both uh, passed away on the same day, April 4th, which was Wednesday earlier this week. Of course, they were uh, years apart. Um, but it begged the question to us to bring up some of our favorite moments in uh, Nirvana and Alice in Chains uh, lore, as well as, you know, just the movement that was the grunge alternative movement in the 90s and what it meant to music for us. I know it, it had a huge impact on my life listening to these uh, two bands and other bands in the genre, of course, as well. And I mean, it was really uh, uh, pop culture at the time, right? I mean, Sam, I know you, you could probably speak to it more than, uh, than Brandon. I mean, he's a few years younger than us. I don't know how much he's gonna weigh on the pop culture side of it, but I know he's familiar with those bands, right? Well, yeah, I mean, I, I look at Nirvana was the band that like got me into music. Like, I mean, Nirvana and no effects because Nirvana is the one that got me to graduate past Weird Al that I was into as a kid. <laughs> that's and, that's quite a jump. I like it. <laughs> well, I mean, there was a little. There's some stuff in between, but I, Nirvana's wait, the wait, first wait, wait. band. Wait, wait, wait. Was it Weird Al's version of Smells Like Teen Spirit? The the the. That was the first CD I bought. Oh my! <laughs> oh, that's <laughs> awesome. Sick. Uh, so no, but I remember where I was when they when I heard Kurt Cobain died. Like to me, like that's one of those memories, like 9/11, that sticks in my brain. Where I can tell you exactly where I was when I heard it and when I found oh. out. I remember I was in Togo's, and uh, yeah, it was just it was a weird thing. I was with my family, and my dad just didn't get it. He's like, "This is just some scummy rock star. Like, what do you care?" And blah blah blah. But it. I, he never, I don't think, ever realized the impact that Nirvana had in changing the sound of music. I mean, there was other bands, obviously, too, like Alice in Chains, who were part of that movement. But to me, Nirvana is, is a will always have a place in my heart as one of the bands that got me to love music the way I do today. So mm. what about you, Brandon? Yeah, you know what? That's honestly a very valid point because it's the same for me. Like when you find your own sense of like music that you like, that you listen to, like you move beyond what your parents listen to in the car or whatever. Mm -hmm. Right. Like yeah. Nirvana was, was that first band for me too. And specifically in bloom. I don't know why, but it was that song. Yeah. And um, even going back to, to like wrestling with it too. Like I would watch uh, WCW and DDP would come out to like some weird version of smells like teen spirit. Yeah. The, so, like, the, 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 the free copyright uh, version yeah. of whatever that was in the Turner <laughs> thing. Like he's talked about that before. How it's, uh, it was like, is that supposed to sound like, like teen spirit? He's like, yeah, that's, <laughs> that's what it was. Yeah. Yeah, for. exactly. So like <laughs> having that and then like hearing the actual song, like, Oh wait. And like putting two and two together. It's like, Oh, that's smells like teen spirit. So like, yeah, Nirvana was, was that first band for me that kind of got me into, rock and liking music and my own taste and finding you know exploring that world yeah i think i think uh for me bands like nirvana alice in chains and i'll throw pearl jam in there too for me as we're talking about this whole movement in the Definitely. in the early 90s is i was a, i was raised a metal head for the most part metal and hard rock and punk hadn't really made too much of an influence on me at this point so i always kind of think of of those bands as my gateway into punk, if that makes any sense. Because they, they kind of have like one foot steeped in it in a lot of ways, especially a, a band like Nirvana uh, early on. Um, and then it became part of pulp culture. And in a lot of ways, I think it set up the movement for bands like Green Day and The Offspring to become part of pulp culture too in a lot of ways. It, had that, it was not as you know, dirty or, and I guess that's why they came up with the quote unquote word grunge for the style of music. When those bands came, came upon the radio and had the pop culture sensations that they were, but I still think that it's set up for those bands to succeed. If you, if you catch my meaning, that it had the set, it had the sound of, you know, one or two guitars, drums, bass guy on some aggressive vocals, but still part of a, a, a popular sound in a way. And I think, I mean, when you listen to like uh, Bleach or something from from Nirvana earlier on, it's way more, way, way, way dirtier, way more punk rock. And then you get to the polished side of, you know, the Nevermind. You guys both mentioned songs from Nevermind. And uh, that's an incredible record. But that was that was the polished version of of what Nirvana was. And then you get into bands like Alice in Chains. They had their foot 
kind of more steeped in metal, in my opinion. Like you yeah. had you, it was it still was that alternative side, but you know you still had you still had Jerry Contrell doing solos and and rad harmonies behind Lane. Um, and I think when you think of those those two bands being in the same genre, it's really wild because like now you could look back at it. But at the time, pop culture just put all those Seattle bands or that Seattle yeah. sounding bands. I mean, Stone Temple Pilots was put into that thing too, you know? And they're all the very Huntington different. Beach. Yeah. yeah, in Huntington Beach, yeah. And it's just, it's really, it's really wild when you think of how not popular that music was supposed to be until it completely took metal by storm. Like, if you go back to there, like, you... The only bands that lived through the grunge era it was like Metallica and Megadeth. Every other band that had gained popularity in the eighties, by ninety one when Nevermind came out, they were on their way out. The the, mm -hmm. the pop culture had decided we were gonna we're gonna move on to this style of music. And I think that's something to that you can speak to when you talk about guys like uh, you know, uh, game changers like Kurt Cobain and Lane Staley. I I it's also interesting if you think about going transferring over to Alice in Chains. Can you? I'm thinking about right now. I mean, they were before like 311, but mm -hmm. like you have a singer and a rapper. There's not very many bands besides like the the Eagles that I can think of that really had multiple singers. That was just a given. Like, hey, no one's gonna complain. Like, oh, I want this guy more. Or I like this guy. I mean, whichever was singing, it's fine, you know, and the fact that it transcended, you know, to Lane Staley passing away, which is why we're talking about this, the fact that, you know, that band could still move on and doesn't feel like a cover band or anything is, is pretty remarkable, I, I feel like. I thought the last Alice in Chains record that came out and was like 2018 or something like that was, was a great, great album too. Yeah. Like, the, uh, Jerry's still leading, the, Jerry and the boys are still leading the charge for Alice in Chains for sure. But you and can't, the guy that I mean, got you, can't, in you can't help fantastic. but think of... And you can't help but think of the band, though, without Lane Staley. Because, I mean, you got songs like Rooster, all the songs that we grew up with, Man in the Box, you know. Um, speaking of Man in the Box, to your point, Brandon, I always thought Man in the Box should have been used for somebody in wrestling's entrance. It was. was it. Who was it? It was. It was Tommy Dreamer. Uh, oh, okay. But I mean, like, okay, Tommy Dreamer was, was what, what was he using in ECW? ECW. Yeah, so ECW didn't give a fuck. They just pulled the song straight up they didn't care about copyright yeah 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 i yeah. mean i was more so meaning like to the mainstream stuff but like yeah because you could just hear that like down 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 yeah that's down yeah. and someone walking down the ramp to go that kick some ass rough. it would be it's it, it, the song is fitting in my opinion if you watch later wwe stuff when he debuted they did do a, a generic cover of it really yeah i have to check mm -hmm. that out but yeah, man, um, another one of my memories, when we're going back to Nirvana, yeah. is, is actually just a, kind of a fun one. And I'm a huge fan of the bassist. Uh, all of his work on Nevermind was insane. And then you get into In Utero with Heart Shaped Box. And, and I feel bad because I, I, I don't even have his name next to me right now. So I, I apologize. But one of the things that uh, I will always remember is their performance at the Music Awards, the MTV Music Awards, where at the end, Kurt Cobain is breaking his guitar into the amp. Oh, Chris Domasalek. What's that? Chris, the bassist, Chris Novoselic? Yeah. That's right. Thank yeah. you very much. Yes, Chris. And he throws his, I believe it was a Stingray, but it was a bigger bass at the time. He throws it straight into the air to catch it, and it smacks him dead in the face, and it kind of knocks him out. And so I don't mean to, like, poke fun. I'm not trying to do that, but it, 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 it's one of those things. It's like watching America's Funniest Home Videos. Like, that shit was funny. Like, everyone went like, oh. <laughs> yeah, I totally remember that. Yeah. And well, anyone listening right now can go though. back and find that. What's that? That's when you guys were like, what, 25? Wow. <laughs> How old do you think I am? Dude, I was like, I was like eight or nine at the time. Like, <laughs> I, I like how you, Johnny gets grouped in my age, even though we're like three years separate. I mean, I, I mean, I guess at this age, what's three years? I mean, fuck. Well, yeah, well, much. At, that, at this point, it, it isn't much. It, it yeah, it's nothing it, it, anymore. No, no, no. But I was, I mean, but when we're talking about the early 90s, I was probably eight or nine. He was probably 12 or 13, right? Right. No, that's what, I mean, you guys were there when this shit was fresh, right? So, like, my brother is your age. So, like, he had all this shit. So, I grew up seeing the Nirvana posters in his room. I grew up seeing the album covers with the kid with his dick out. And it's like, what is this shit? And then, like, hearing the music and then actually growing up and listening to it and 
having an appreciation for it. It's kind of cool. Like you understand it. You're like, oh, I get why you had the posters and all this shit. This is good music. And you know, the other thing that uh, I think was lost when it first came to pop culture, a lot of people were just like, I remember as a kid and you could speak to this a little bit, Sam, but everyone was just saying they're not good musicians. Like in these bands like Nirvana and, and Alice in Chains, there was, there was a lot of talk about that. Well, there's just noise. It's all this blah, blah, blah. When it's, and that's kind of common when something new and fresh comes out. A lot of people, the old heads don't, don't tend to really like it. But I feel like for both these bands, when, and I'll throw Pearl Jam in here again too, because I also love their version uh, of what they did with it. MTV, MTV Unplugged was a thing. You heard, you oh, saw yeah. uh, Eric Clapton do it previously, and he does a beautiful rendition of Tears in Heaven. One of my, I mean, a song that he already had, but he does it acoustically, and I almost think it became more popular than the original version. Um, and then you had a juxtaposition with that with Kurt Cobain, known for the electric guitars being slammed and being overdriven all crazy, his voice going wild. And you have the rest of the guys sitting there on that stage doing Unplugged, which is a storytelling uh, uh, and songwriter's uh, haven, right? And I think that's when everyone first kind of realized, at least in the, uh, who weren't fans yet of Nirvana, just how brilliant Cobain was when it comes to songwriting and arranging and just everything that goes into telling a story through the art that is music. And I think he, he kind of was the first one in that movement to do it with the rest of the guys, of course. I'm not taking anything away from guys like Dave Grohl and Chris and, and, and uh, Schmier that were uh, a part of that as well. Um, but, I mean, that was an album I bought. Like, I bought that as part of my discography when I go to the Nirvana section. Unplugged had to be a part of that, right? I've got it mm -hmm. on vinyl now. And then you get into going to Lane Staley. Another thing, when... I don't think everyone quite understood what, to Sam's point, having the two vocals was really doing for the sound of Alice in Chains. You, you always heard Lane Staley, he had the raspier, more front poignant voice, but behind him at all times was Jerry Cantrell doing the, the, the harmonies with a, with a slightly softer voice. And that was part of that eerie sound that they created. And it really was showcased when they went on and did their Unplugged as well. Well, I think a lot of people back then, too, I think the reason why that era is still celebrated, I was just thinking about right now as you're talking about it, um, because if you think you see like, you know, anything that grew up in, we got really lucky in the, the era we grew up with where a lot of stuff we had like Ninja Turtles and music and like the TV shows they're redoing. That's all from when we grew up. So yeah. I think what they did was it's not like they reinvented, but they took for example i'll just say grunge it's very formulaic of like verse chorus verse i mean they're generic structures but everyone was able to input their own sound into that but nothing strayed too far from what a pleasing melody would be right so the way i'm talking about is like you know you have allison chains who maybe mix some like motown in with like rooster where they got the background vocals and then you got nirvana who you know, would get really loud, but their writing structure was kind of the same. Um, Pearl Jam, they would do a soft one and then a rock one, but I feel like that era definitely made music that will stand the test of time just because it was reminiscent about the old, but created something new. Now everything's a little more, and maybe this is old man Sammy here, uh, everything is like computer-based or it's, it's specific to a certain you have to like this, or you have to like a constant thumping of whatever beat. Um, I don't know where I'm, I'm talking about, but I, I do feel like it was a little more simple. People actually used instruments rather than computers at that time. It was be able to replicate at a concert. And I, that, I mean, that music now, there's so many people who write music on their computer, and then you're gonna go see them live, they're not even gonna be able to play it, or you know, the computer's playing it and they're just singing on it. So I do like that it was a more organic feel back then. Not that people aren't doing it now, but it's it was a different time, and yeah, I think that's well, why it's more true. Yeah, I, th I think you, I think there's part there, there's reasons why that is the, the case these days. I mean, you gotta you gotta adapt with the times, and it is good to use the technology uh, that you have in front of you to expand upon your art. I do agree with. I do think that that's a smart thing to do. But I think what you're touching upon is the fact that they. That these bands, you know, that Kurt Cobain and Lane Staley were kind of the, the front men of, 
um, <laughs> whether they liked it or not, to be honest, as we know, Kurt Cobain was a bit of an introvert. Um, but, you know, when they, it, it forces these two bands specifically, it was very emotional. And I think that's what everyone attached themselves to. Like, it wasn't, it wasn't just what they said or the sound or anything like that. It was this raw emotion that whether, whether or not you agreed with it, it was, you couldn't turn your head or you couldn't not listen to it because it was just real. I mean, that was just, that was what they were being themselves and writing the music and, and damn, it was something that like, like I said, pop culture hadn't heard yet. We'd heard it in punk rock in the eighties and stuff like that to, to a certain extent. But this is the first time where like, you know, they're, they're the biggest bands in the world at the time. I mean, like that, uh, there's just no denying it. And, and to Brandon's point too, where it just, it stands the test of time that way because it was so real. I mean, that's what, if you can invoke that motion in your music, I feel that that's what's going to make it have longevity. Well, it was relatable too, because it looked like people that you knew, right? So, I mean, grunge, yeah, grungy. I mean, that's the extreme of dirty or whatever, but like, I don't, I wouldn't say Pearl Jam was dirty looking or anything like that. But it looked like, hey, I could be that person. Well, and that's Eddie's why it killed. Point. What'd you say? Well, Eddie's from Dana Point. It was the difference of being from Seattle or Dana Point. <laughs> <laughs> well, but but it kind of, like you said, killed the metal. So that 80s hair, the glam, the pop, mm -hmm. the big showiness. It's like now you're seeing people on MTV that, hey, I could do that. And I do think that that is another big push of why mm -hmm. that era and Nirvana specifically of just looking like regular guys kind of helped encourage people to follow that and kind of look at it a little more and pay a little more attention. That's um, a fair point. But yeah, but I remember, I don't know if you guys back in those days, I mean, this is even pre like Napster. I remember going to like, I would love finding these record stores that would have these bootleg CDs. And I remember I had like three different like Nirvana bootlegs. One was like a, a concert from, uh Rome that was really big. I think they ended up releasing it later. Or I would find B sides with all these just rad tracks that were unreleased. I mean now you can get everything in a box set, but uh just thinking about Nirvana specifically, finding just so much like unreleased stuff was pretty rad to be able to do that and find it in the wild back then. So did you guys dig deep or were you guys just kind of surface level or I mean I was I was in probably third grade at the time. And uh, when uh, Boomer Pearl Jam's album Ten came out, that was the first tape. Yeah, yeah, wow. Uh, that was the first uh, one of the first tape cassettes that I bought. I bought, I bought that one on tape cassette, and then um, so I think it was. And at, and at that point, Pearl Jam had just uh, won like a Grammy for album of the year. It closed out the show that year, and that was that was what I, I mean. I'd heard Nirvana, who precursored them, and and Alice in Chains. But I, I didn't use my allowance to buy their albums. I started with Pearl Jam and then went, went back from there. Um, but I, I mean, for me, I just remember transcribing uh, on, on the, all those bass lines on Nevermind. That was one of the things when I first picked it. By the time I was 12, Nevermind had been out for several years. But it was something that I, I realized that, like, I mean, boom, do, 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 boom, do, do, do. I remember thinking that was, like, the coolest bass line for me to, for me to learn, you know, and it's like, so many other things like musically and then uh, you know come full circle where first time i'm mixing with andy wallace i look up on the wall and there's a commem commemorative commemorative i could say it right commemorative album uh produced to andy wallace for mixing and producing that record and he's done all of our records since, since city of evil and it's like you look up and you're like wow that's that's wild i used to transcribe those very songs and now I'm here working with the same man that worked with Cor with Kurt Cobain, the late great Kurt Cobain. And it's just a, uh, it's 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 definitely wild. And then you know we're now on Velvet Hammer uh, management with Allison Chains and and Jerry's still around. You know uh, after you know continuing on after the late great Lane Stanley. And I think that I'm glad that we were able to talk a little bit about that this week because I was traveling in the car on the radio and someone on the radio station said, "Oh, you're going to hear a lot of Nirvana and Allison Chains today because." This is this is the uh, uh, the day that they both passed, and I, I guess I never realized that they had passed on the same day, um, years apart. You know, I think it was 2002. They said it was Lane Staley, and it was the 29th anniversary of the passing of Kurt Cobain. Was well, is isn't they are they both part of that 27 Club 
or is that no, am I incorrect? No, no. Uh, Lane Lane was uh, 34, I believe. Oh. I think Cobain was though. Cobain, I believe, was a 27er. Yeah. Sad man. Both gone too soon. Definitely legends, and uh, you know, just wanted to pay our homage to those two guys and uh, the trailblazers that they were in the, the music scene. So glad uh, I could share this uh, conversation with you guys. Yeah. Definitely. Definitely worth checking out Alice in Chains. I caught him last year and Lane Staley. Uh, not Lane, uh, Jerry Cantrell himself, just solo. So fucking definitely worth checking out. Absolutely. Uh, Go check those out. So, uh, all right. Well, I guess that's it for uh, this uh, Friday edition of Drinks with Johnny. Thanks for checking us out. Make sure you subscribe. All those fun things. We've got another episode for you coming uh, probably Monday. So make sure you subscribe in case it comes out Tuesday. See you later. <laughs> Cheers. <laughs>